In this video, I'm going to keep working our way backwards through this pipeline. Um, remember where we started, which is um, what action will we take based on our, our final comparison? Um, are we going to do something different on the website? Uh, maybe we just learned something without wanting to change anything. Are we trying to debug um, some code that's maybe a new version? Um, that's all based on a comparison. And we saw one way that we can uh, do the comparison. We could just see, well, uh, what has the max click-through rate and draw with that. Um, we also saw more statistically uh, meaningful ways to do it. Like we could say, stay with version A unless uh, there's statistical evidence uh, that B is significantly better, right? So we could do that. Uh, working back, I'm gonna talk about what some of those different metrics might be. And, uh, and then after that, we're gonna talk about different things that you might be changing. And then finally, what's surprisingly hard is, well, how do we actually divide um, users or requests across different versions. <clears throat> so there's lots of things you can measure. Um, I've been giving the example of clicks. Uh, maybe just to kind of think for a moment, when would clicks be bad? Uh, is, is it ever not a good idea? Um, I can imagine that one case is, well, maybe I'm clicking on the site and interacting with it, but I'm clicking things like on subscribe, right? If I'm not careful, maybe that's not what I want to measure. Um, other things, like if I have some sort of news feed, maybe I'm not clicking anything, but am I kind of scrolling through and, and reading the news feed or reading an article? Um, am I subscribing or unsubscribing? What other ideas um, can you think of? Just take a moment and uh, maybe write a couple down on a piece of paper. For a lot of um, companies, maybe they care about things like, well, how many purchases do we get? And uh, and if there's false advertising, well, maybe your purchases look good, but then people return it. So we also want to think about, well, how often are people returning things? Sometimes they'll track, are you hovering your mouse over a link, right? Maybe it shows that you have some sort of interest, even though you're not clicking it. Um, on Facebook, are you sharing content, upvoting it, downvoting it, uh, leaving comments on it? There's all these actions that humans take when they're on websites, and they could all be fed into uh, metrics. Now, a, a lot of companies will come up with different combinations of these metrics. Um, so for example, uh, Bing, instead of just kind of simply measuring how often people click on things, they wanna know how often they're clicking on something that's actually helpful to them as a search result. So they'll say, did you click on the link and then not hit the back button uh, with 30 seconds, right? So they're kind of combining these two events, a click and then not a back. Um, some of these are, are kind of related in tricky ways. So for example, um, let's say that I am sending really spammy emails, right? Uh, if I do that, if I send more spammy emails, then maybe I'm gonna get people to purchase more things, but I also might be making them unsubscribe, which will hurt me in the long run, right? So, so these kind of different metrics that make a lot of sense for a business, you have to think carefully about how to combine them and weigh them uh, in some way, right? And especially what's tricky here is when you're doing A-B testing, it's really easy to optimize for the short term and, and to kind of forget about the long term. Um, a third thing is, well, uh, before you get something you like, like let's say a customer buying something, usually there's some sort of um, pipeline that they go through, right? Maybe they go to your homepage and, uh, and then maybe they click on a product that you're advertising and, uh, and then maybe they actually go to checkout, then maybe they complete checkout. And, uh, and well, they might fall off of that at different points, right? So for example, if I remove the price from the product page link, well, uh, maybe they click on it and then later they find out, well, I don't really want this. If I put the price up front, well, then probably fewer people will click on it, but since they're going in informed, they'll probably continue all the way through the pipeline. Um, so. Uh, there are some lessons here that Ron has in his uh, talk. And um, the, the lesson about this pipeline is that, well, it's really easy to shift uh, links you know, forward and back. It's harder to actually come up with a change that improves uh, purchases. Uh, in terms of these spammy uh, emails, uh, it's really hard to measure long-term effects because, well, it's noisy. Lots of other things come into play. And so you have to be using common sense as well. Don't kind of just unthinkingly follow the metrics. So another pitfall, it's very easy to do an experiment and look out at all the metrics and then pick some that will convince you that 
uh, you did a good job, right? I mean, everybody wants to think they're doing a good job. So what you should do beforehand is you should come up with one metric or maybe a couple metrics that you're going to use to overall kind of judge how you did. And those are called OECs or overall experiment uh, criterions. And uh, Bing, uh, for example, has thousands of metrics that used to debug things, but they have only four that really kind of measure what they care about as a business. So you have to think carefully about that. And that's probably a combination of these simpler uh, metrics, right, that are factoring things like, are people unsubscribing? Are they buying things? What are they clicking? Um, it, it's hard to have a, a single metric that captures it all, or a single simple metric that captures it all. Um, uh, one, another lesson, right, is uh, that Trovani had is that if you make something bigger, people will click on it, right? That's not surprising, um, but there's a cost there, right? I mean, I can only fit so many things on the page. Sure, if I make a search result bigger, people will click on it, but they won't click on other things. So you have to think carefully not just about the benefit that you're trying to measure, but about the cost, right? Maybe I can uh, do something like divide click-through rate by the number of pixels on the screen that I'm actually using. Another thing that you have to be careful about is figuring out what traffic you're actually looking at. Um, we've talked a little bit about tracing uh, applications, like in Flask, like how can I kind of log different events that are happening. And, uh, and, and that's important, like I could do these A-B uh, analysis studies based on those traces, but the thing is, is not every uh, kind of visit to my website might be a human. There are all of these bots that are scraping websites, and now you know how to do that too. Um, and for Bing, for example, over half of all their traffic is from unauthorized bots, right? So we're gonna get these traces that can have all this mix of these things. And so what you'll wanna do before you run any sort of metrics is try to filter out the non-humans. And there's different ways you could do that. I mean, uh, I'm guessing a bot can visit way more pages per second than a human could. And so you'll want to have some sort of consistent way to clean up the data before I do something like click-through rate. Otherwise, I'm just going to be measuring garbage. So we've talked about these metrics. Uh, let's talk about some of the factors that we could change that might influence these metrics, like bigger font or red font. Um, uh, in, in general, right, we want to be running two variants side by side, you know, maybe a control or version A and a treatment or version B. And, and, and for our treatment, um, there's all these different things we could change, right? I mean, we could change how we word things. Um, we could change the color of it. Um, sometimes just to understand how important performance is to users, these companies will artificially slow down the site and just see, well, do people still use the site if it were slower? Um, and so there's all these different things you could do. Right, and here are some more. And it's kind of hard to optimize all of these. So you have to make this decision, do I just change one thing at a time? Or when I'm doing an experiment, when I'm doing my treatment, do I ever change multiple things um, at, at the same time? And so I'm gonna be talking about strategies for that. Um, another thing I want you to think about as we're looking at all of these different factors is that some of them actually take a lot of time to do the experiment. You actually have to write, write new code, right? If I want to have a recommendation algorithm, somebody has to write that. Uh, if I want to have a database that's faster for some queries, well, I actually have to, you know, deploy a new database. Uh, maybe if I'm a graphics designer, I have to make something. And uh, and so to do all of these experiments, right, we have to make multiple versions of the same thing with the knowledge that we're going to throw something away. And so lesson here is don't become too attached to your work. Uh, it's okay to be redundant and then throw away what doesn't work. We're kind of scientists, right? Um, and I see this all the time, actually, with my students when they're doing um, projects. Often uh, people will maybe start down the wrong road, but they've written a lot of code. And then when they discover that there's a more elegant way to do things, it, it's actually kind of painful to throw away all that uh, work you've done. But in any sort of creative work, well, that's what you should do, right? Now, the flip side of this is there's also plenty of low-hanging fruit. Right? I mean, if we're arguing about, well, how big should the font be, um, I can change that quickly. And so one of um, uh, Ron's pieces of advice is, well, stop debating and just get the data sometimes. And that's true as well. Okay, so as we're ma making these changes, um, how are we going to do that? Um, let's say that I have this hypothesis that people will click on my text more if it's large and red. So there's two ways I could do it. I could try changing one factor at a time, and the abbreviation for that is OFAT, O-F-A-T. 
um you, you know what i mean i can kind of change it to red and as an separate experiment i can change it to be larger and then maybe eventually i converge on, on kind of large red font uh the option two is i can go straight to um that final option and, and kind of um and have both and, and there's trade-offs here right when i'm doing option two well maybe i come up with an improvement and that's nice but the disadvantage is well i didn't really learn anything right so you kind of have to think about Am I trying to learn something or, or just kind of, you know, find something that somehow magically works, right? I don't know. Maybe all the improvement came from making it red and it doesn't matter how large it is. Um, and this first option, uh, there's also a disadvantage. One is that maybe these features combine in some way. Maybe people don't like red font, so it has a slower, uh, low, maybe people don't like small red font and they don't like big, uh, uh, black font, maybe they only like a uh, large red font. And, and so if that's the case, I'm only exploring one thing at a time, maybe um, as I make one change or the other change, I think, well, this is a bad idea in general. And I never try the thing that is, is really what I'm looking for, right? And, uh, and so there's trade-offs here. Um, an analogy people will actually make um, is to uh, imagine that you're climbing in some mountains, right? And so I stole this from Wikipedia. You can see that there's somebody kind of walking up some mountains here. And this is the train, so this is some sort of peak. And uh, how, how can I make this analogy work, right? So you can kind of see that there's like an X and Y here, right, to the space of things I'm exploring. And there's an X and Y here um, as well, right? Maybe this is like, well, this maybe this is kind of like how, uh, you know, from black to red, there's all kinds of shades in between. Maybe this is the size. And I'm trying to explore different points in this space, right? And, um, and and so maybe how high I am, you know, if I'm at the top of a peak or something, um, how high I am can represent, well, what the click-through rate is, right? And so reaching a peak is representing a really high uh, click-through rate. And, and so what we want to do is we're kind of exploring through this is figure out, well, what should I do? I mean, I could just randomly jump around and, and then kind of like see, well, what was best? And I could keep that. That's actually people sometimes do that and it's a reasonable thing. Uh, but we'll generally have some sort of hill climbing algorithm where we take kind of a step and see if it's better, maybe another step, see if it's better, kind of one piece at a time, right? And uh, the disadvantage, right, is that if there's multiple peaks, maybe I end up over here when maybe the best spot was like over here, right? And so you maybe want to try a bit of both, right? Sometimes I'm just trying to take one step at a time, uh, always uphill. Other times I might want to jump around a little bit and see if that there's a completely different design that's trying to be a lot better. Um, something that's really kind of unique to this idea of where we're doing these A-B experiments on a web application is that the control and treatment might interact with each other. So for example, say that I have version A and version B, and they're both using a shared database, and version B somehow is doing something that's uh, really putting a lot of load on the database. It's making it really slow. Uh, well, <laughs> if version B makes the database slow, well, then that'll slow down version A too. And I might not really see the big difference between these in the metric. You could even imagine a more horrible case where version B crashes the whole server, and then absolutely the metric will be identical because, well, <laughs> um, nothing's running, right? Nobody's clicking on anything because the site is down, right? So you have to be careful, right? And so just looking at these metrics um, for the two versions, maybe you want to see, like, hey, has version A uh, has its behavior changed over time from before when I started the experiment to when I began? Another real concern is that humans like novelty. So maybe I try something, you know, version B, and maybe it's worse, but people like it better anyway, just because it's something that's new. And so a good strategy here is that when I first do the experiment, maybe I have most of it on the original version, which is A, and then I give a few users version B. Um, and let's say version B ends up being better, then at this point in time, I, I switch over and, uh, and I'll mostly switch to version B, but not completely. Maybe I will still start showing, keep showing some percentage of the people uh, version A um, to see that, well, maybe that's the novel thing now. And, and eventually I might discover that and then maybe I want to switch back, right? I don't want to just make changes based on novelty, thinking that it's for the long term. Okay, all the way back here at the beginning of the process, 
how do I decide who sees version A and who sees version B? Um, and the ex example I gave at the very beginning when I was talking about programmers and coffee, uh, it, it was very easy. I just kind of divided the programmers into two groups and I gave them each a different treatment, right? Um, here it's going to be a little bit trickier in a number of ways. Um, one issue is that uh, if the experiment is making things a lot worse, uh, it, it, it can actually have a real cost to the business. So let's say my A version is up here, and most people are not clicking, but there's a good chunk that do. And let's say that as I start doing my experiment, the no click is a much larger portion relative to click uh, than, than kind of the ratio was up here. In that case, I probably want to abort my experiment earlier to minimize my losses, right? Don't go straight to deploying the new thing, kind of slowly ramp up and stop if it looks like it's going to be a disaster. Um, the other thing that's really tricky is um, kind of splitting these, right? So from the server's perspective, right over here, we have this timeline and there's requests coming from all kinds of different users, right? I mean, I have these three users over here, they're all sending requests. They're kind of interleaved from my perspective of a, as, 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 of a server. And, uh, and so what I could do that would be simple is that I could say, well, half of the requests get version A and half get version B. Uh, but, but that's not great for a number of reasons. One is that it's going to be really weird for these users. Like if I see one version of the site and then like it suddenly changes for me, it feels inconsistent and bad. Um, so what I really like to do is somehow split the, the users instead, right? How can I split these people so that one person always sees version A, another person always sees version B. So we have to identify them somehow. There's a few ways. There's um, IP addresses, right? Each of these computers has some sort of IP address. Um, some, some things that you have to sign into, right? Like, um, you know, maybe Facebook or, or my email, I have to sign into it. I know exactly who you are. And then maybe you've heard about cookies too. Cookies can be used to kind of track who people are. So let's start with IP address. I think all of these have some disadvantages and uh, and there's no best answer. Um, I'm not trying to get into a lot of details about networking, but in organizations, there's often this thing called a NAT, which is a network uh, address translation layer. And basically what the effect is, is that I have this big organization um, and inside of it, everybody's computer has a different IP address, but to the outside world, um, there's this layer that kind of uh, makes it look like they all have the same IP address. So, so maybe I'm over here and there's lots of different people using my website, but uh, maybe it feels like there's many different people um, involved, right? So IP addresses can kind of work, but it's hard to tell, kind of distinguish people sometimes who might be inside of the same um, organization. Um, signed in services, I think that's really uh, ideal when it's an option, uh, but it's not an, it's often not an option. Um, for example, let's say like the thing I'm trying to optimize is how many people sign up um, and create an account on my website when they visit it. Obviously, if they haven't created an account yet, I can't track them based on their account, right? So uh, and there's lots of other web services too where there's just no, um, sign in required, right? I mean, it would be pretty annoying if you had to sign into something before you could use, you know, Bing or Google to do a search, right? So, uh, lots of cases where we can't use signed in services, though if we can, uh, that that's wonderful. Um, maybe some of you have heard about cookies. Uh, I'm actually going to show some code on the next page uh, about how a cookie works. Um, but uh, basically what a cookie is, is a little bit of information here on the computer, right? And every time the person comes here, that information gets sent over here. And, uh, and so the cookie could maybe remember who um, somebody is, right? And, um, and, and there's some disadvantages to that. One, one disadvantage is that, well, uh, people can delete cookies. There's some legal things. I guess I'll get into that a little bit more after we look at the code. So here I'm having my Flask application. And I have my home page here. And uh, you can see that whenever ever I'm here, I can print off request.cookies, uh, or I could say request.cookies.get. It's basically like a, a big dictionary, right? So I can have that dictionary there. And, uh, and then when I respond, I can have my response object and I can set cookies there. And so if somebody keeps visiting this site again and again, um, I'm gonna have this user key and then some sort of value with it. And so I can keep track of who they are. And I can make up user IDs however I want. Maybe uh, this is not a great way, but I could have, well, what time of uh, 
what time of day is it when they come and that's suddenly your ID. That might get some uh, redundancy there, uh, but uh, it'd be better than nothing. Right, so I can do that. I can keep getting the same dictionary and I can see if uh, the same person is coming back again. Okay, so why is this? Uh, uh, well, first off, I mean, there's some advantages. That's definitely more accurate than IP address, uh, but there's all these problems. Uh, one is cookie churn. Uh, people uh, can delete their cookies, which they actually do pretty often. Right, so then maybe somebody who's an old user uh, returning actually ends up looking like a new user. Um, people often uh, browse websites in incognito mode. Incognito mode does not save any of these cookies, so that would also make it look like it was somebody uh, new. And uh, then there's this whole legal thing, right? Sometimes local laws might not allow you to have cookies uh, without the informed consent of the user. Um, in particular, the European Union, uh, there are these GDPR laws that uh, kind of govern that. And I'm not trying to pretend I'm an expert on uh, all of these legal angles, um, especially internationally, uh, but it's a real concern, right? I think uh, cookies are in some ways sketchy, right? That we're kind of tracking users in this way, and the law has been uh, catching up to that. So to summarize, we have our little picture here, and just to kind of work backwards, uh, why are we doing A-B testing to start with? Well, for different reasons. Maybe we want to make a business decision. Um, in other cases, maybe we're trying to debug a new version of the code or, or sometimes even just learn something about humanity. Um, we have to do comparisons in different ways. Maybe if I'm trying to do a business decision, well, I just choose whatever has the highest metric. If I'm trying to learn something, well, I have to probably use something more rigorous like significance testing. Uh, we saw that there's a lot of different metrics. Um, you know, am I... There's simple metrics like, you know, am I uh, clicking on something? Is my mouse hovering over it? Am I looking at it? And then lots of uh, combos. Maybe did I click on something and then not click back? Um, before we can do these metrics, we want to clean up our data uniformly to pull out any sort of bot traffic. And then we want to have maybe like one final metric that we're trying to optimize. That's probably a combination of a bunch of these simple ones. Uh, and, and then finally, you know, don't just follow the metrics, whatever they tell you. But you know, be a human and use your intuition, and uh, don't chase small gains if you're doing something that might hurt your brand or your business. Or of course, you know, don't do anything that's unethical, right? Um, in terms of treatment, we saw that we there's lots of different factors we can change about our website. Of course, um, we saw that factors often involve a lot of coding and design work, and so. If we're in this whole idea of, well, I'm going to build version A and version B and eventually throw away the one that's not that great, well, I just have to be in this mindset that it's okay to do redundant work and throw something away. That, that's fine in creative fields. Um, uh, we saw that there's different strategies. I can change one thing at a time. That kind of helps me learn things, but it's harder to make drastic redesigns. Uh, we, we talked about how novelty can be a factor. After we do an A-B test, well, do something like a BA test and see if uh, if the novelty wears off and we should uh, uh, switch back. Finally, we talked about how we would split traffic between versions A and B. And, uh, and one lesson is that do it slowly, right? It's possible version B is terrible and uh, it's too expensive to do the whole experiment. And, uh, and then second, it actually is very hard to split people. Uh, we learned about a few different ways with different uh, trade-offs, right? If we have an account for them, that's awesome. Otherwise, we have to use some sort of hint, like what is their IP address or, or what cookie are they dealing with?